All right, so welcome again, everyone, to another exciting organic chemistry class. This is a quick review of general chemistry two. Let's get started. All right, so first question, what is organic chemistry? All right, so organic chemistry is really the study of um, carbon containing uh, molecules, but the focus is really on the movement of electrons that's really the focus so here's a typical reaction where you have um this is referred to as a substitution reaction where you have a hydroxyl group attacking a methyl iodide and the iodide is substituted by a hydroxyl to give you your alcohol so in essence organic chemistry is really focused on the study or the movement of electrons not necessarily atom all right and then why should i care why is this important um for for most of you guys um based on what I, what you said uh you're interested in heading into the medicinal uh field whether as a pharmacist uh a doctor um researcher so in terms of applications our organic chemistry have applications in the food industry clothing industry pharmaceuticals uh, plastics um, and in terms of just a typical reaction uh, we can convert an inorganic molecule like ammonium cyanide just by heating that to form an organic molecule like urea as shown all right so here are the brief highlights of chapter one i'm just touching on the brief highlights all right so First thing you want to learn about is um, what's constitutional isomer? What is that? So constitutional isomers are compounds that have the same molecular formula, but they're connected differently. And when I say connected differently, it means that they have different constitution, right? In terms of the oxygen being connected to a carbon versus a hydrogen, they're just connected differently. That, that's all it means, all right? So Different molecules will have different physical properties, also different chemical properties. So like if you notice on the far left, we have like dimethyl ether. It has a boiling point of minus 23. Ethanol that has the same molecular formula, but different connectivity has a boiling point of 78.4 degrees Celsius. All right, so that's as it relates to the structural theory. Now, another thing that's important that you need to know or you need to remember is this, um, connectivity, right? Always remember that for carbon, carbon is tetravalent, meaning, meaning that carbon is always bonded to four different atoms. Nitrogen is trivalent, means it's attached to three. Oxygen is always divalent, it's attached to other atoms, whereas uh, the halogens, like your fluorine, chlorine, bromine, are monovalent. They're always connected to one other atom in order to satisfy its valency. So to have like a full octet, right? Remember that. So that's as it relates to the connectivity of the different atoms. So if you go back to the periodic table, your job is to memorize what groups do the different atoms come in. Like say boron is in group three, Carbon is in group four, nitrogen is group five, oxygen is in group six, fluorine is in group seven, uh, and so forth and so on. Because this is important in calculating like formal charges, which we will do today. So just to remind you of where the elements appear in the periodic table. All right, so next up we have Lewis structure. So Lewis structure just kind of talks about the different atoms and their valence electrons, right? So if you take ammonia as your target molecule, if you kind of break them apart, ammonia, the nitrogen in ammonia has five valence electrons, right? So three of the electrons are involved in the bonding, whereas two electrons are unpaired. We refer to those unpaired electrons as a lone pair right so when you draw like a lewis structure of say ammonia this is what it would look like right and then when you kind of draw that uh structure you'll notice that there is a a lone pair that's present that's not connected to any other 
atom. Check. And then another topic that you'll look at is what's referred to as a formal charge. So formal charge means that if you're if the net charge on the molecule is negative, you'll have like a minus sign on it. Um, and that's referred to as an anion. If it has a positive charge, it's referred to as a cation. And that's important. And then also, if we go back to the periodic table, you'll remember the term electronegativity. So the trend is as you go from left to right, electronegativity increases. That's because we're increasing the number of protons in your atom. And then as we go from bottom to top, electronegativity also increases, all right? And why is that important? That is an important as it relates to bonding. So if you remember the different types of bonding that we discussed in general chemistry, you have like your covalent bond, your polar covalent bond, and your ionic bond. So how does electronegativity affect that? So as the difference in electronegativity changes between the two atoms, like say if you move from a carbon-carbon bond to a carbon-oxygen bond to like a, um, a nitrogen-chlorine bond, as the difference in electronegativity increases, um, the bonding changes. So it's no longer a covalent. It goes from covalent to polar covalent to ionic. So it's more like an attraction and a sharing of electrons, right? Then we jump on to atomic orbitals. So if you guys remember in Gen Chem, when you talked about the off bar principle, Pauli exclusion principle and the Hans rule, that kind of talks about how electrons are filled in the atomic orbital. So if you remember the off bar principle, it says that you start at the lowest energy level, moving all the way to the top energy layer, energy level. The Pauli exclusion, Oops, there is a hand raised. Kyron, you have a question. Go for it. Um, I have a, I do have a question. Can you go over how to find formal charge again? Like, I'm going to do that in chapter two. Don't worry about it. Okay. We'll do that. We're going to have fun doing that in chapter two. Any other questions before I continue? All right. So the Pauli exclusion principle just tells that uh, electrons in the same shell must be oppositely have opposite spin and Hunt rule just pretty much says that once you reach a degenerate orbital like the p orbital they have to be each electron have to um, occupy a single orbital before you start to pair them up that's all that's saying and what does that mean um, in terms of the implication of this it has to do with another topic that we'll cover that's talking about hybridization and hybridization is talking about um, bonding, right? How do we represent this atomic orbital theory in terms of bonding? So if we talk about an, a carbon atom being sp3 hybridized, what does that mean? So if you guys remember from general chemistry, um, hybridization is just a mixing of atomic orbitals where you may have a 2s mixing with a 2p, so you end up with four degenerate sp3 orbitals and that kind of explains uh the shape of an sp3 orbital it has 25 percent s character 75 percent p character so let's say the right side is the p the left side is the s and in terms of bonding uh for carbon it has four sp3 orbital that's the reason why carbon is tetravalent. So it means carbon always bonds to four different atoms. Does that make sense, guys? So that's the reason why carbon is tetravalent, because it's sp3 hybridized, meaning it always bonds to four different groups. Okay. Now let's look at a different example. Let's look at an sp2 hybridized carbon. So for an sp2 hybridized carbon, what am I saying with that? So in that particular scenario you have one of the s orbital the 2s orbital that mix with only two of the um p orbitals so one of the p orbitals is left unaffected but what you have 
as a result of the hybridization is you have three sp2 hybridized orbitals what does that mean so that simply means that um you have a p orbital that has an electron that's unaffected you have three sp2 hybridized orbital so the question is how does it affect bonding here's how it affects bonding um if you have two carbon atoms that um, interact with each other, they form a sigma bond overlap, and then the, on the p orbital that was not affected forms what we call the chi bond, right? So if you remember when we talk about double bond, if you guys remember double bond, it's formed from the overlap of your, the side overlap of your p orbital and your sigma bond, right? So that's how you get your carbon-carbon double bond. And then how do I get my carbon-carbon triple bond? Same deal. Uh, in this scenario, you're just simply reacting an S orbital with one of the P orbital. So you only form two degenerate SP orbitals and you have two P orbitals that are unaffected. And as a result of that, you have like a sigma bond with, with another carbon, and then you have two uh, side uh, p orbitals overlap to give you your triple bond. So what's the takeaway from all what I'm saying? The takeaway is this, guys. All right, so a triple bond, in terms of its strength, it's stronger than a double bond, and a double bond is stronger than a single bond. In terms of the length, the triple bond is shorter, than the um the double bond why because the triple bond has more s character than the double bond and likewise the double bond is also shorter than the the um the sp3 hybridized um carbons um because um it has for the same reason it has uh, more s character than the sp3 hybridized carbon check almost done so with chapter one, the next topic that you want to look at is what's called the Vesper theory. That's a valence shell electron pair repulsion. So that kind of tells us the shapes of the different molecules in terms of is it uh, uh, trigonal, is it pyramidal, uh, is it bent? So that's pretty much that. That's a Topic that's covered in that sense and that's all based on what's called the steric number i'm not going to go into details with that i'm going to let you guys read that so based on the steric number uh if it's four like when you do the addition like say steric number like how many sigma bonds are present how many lone pairs are present if the number is four it just means that the shape of that atom will occupy a tetrahedral type geometry if the steric number is three it will be like an sp2 hybridized type geometry if it's two it's sp what do i mean by that so here are some examples right so in the example of say methane carbon in the middle three hydrogens at the end um the third number for this is four so that means that the atoms the hydrogen atoms are kind of spread out in a tetrahedral type format so they are far away from each other as possible right so for like methane, it, it has like a tetrahedral type geometry for the ammonia, which is a nitrogen that has a lone pair. Um, it also occupies a tetrahedral type geometry, but because you have a lone pair, um, we can ignore that and say that it, it's more like a trigonal pyramidal type geometry. And then for water, it has two lone pairs. It also occupies a tetrahedral geometry. But with the lone pair, if you remove the lone pair, we'll say that water has a bent type structure. So if you summarize everything, um, looking at the steric number, if it's sp3 hybridized, it occupies a tetrahedral type geometry. So if there are no lone pairs present, it's tetrahedral. If it's one lone pair, like in ammonia, it's tri um, trigonal uh, pyramidal. If it's two lone pairs, it's bent like water. Boom. So that's one example. If your steric number is three, 
where it's an sp2 hybridized orbital like say like your boron trifluoride um the shape or the arrangement of the atom would be more for trigonal planar and if it's an sp type geometry like you know like dry ice um carbon with two oxygen uh it's linear because you have two double bonds so that's a summary of um what to expect as it relates to the vesper theory so i'm just giving you guys just a taste of what to expect when you read through chapter one it's an easy read the kent text is a student friendly book so you will not have any problems in reading the klein text is that so far so good guys in terms of a quick summary of chapter one any questions regarding yes. so far so good all right okay and then in just to wrap up chapter one um the only thing that uh is completed you guys cover this already in gen chem when you talk about dipole moment and net dipole moment that has to do with uh, um uh, the electronegativity in the molecule so say you know chlorine is more electronegative than carbon so it has like a net dipole moment in one direction so that's the reason you know the the the, the, the phrase that says like dissolves like. So if your molecule has a strong difference in electronegativity, like your water, it's gonna be polar. So only polar substance will dissolve in polar substances, like right. And then if your molecule is nonpolar like your hydrocarbons um only nonpolar molecules will dissolve in nonpolar substances so like dissolves like that's just a takeaway for that particular topic and finally the key thing that you should remember is a review of the type of interactions between intermolecular forces like your dipole dipole interaction your hydrogen bonding your dispersion forces, which you already know. So an example, if you have a polar molecule that has dipole-dipole attraction, it's gonna be more stronger than one that is a non-polar type attraction. How do I know that? They have an increased boiling point, increased melting point. If you compare acetone to like isobutylene, another example, Hydrogen bonding. Uh, molecules with hydrogen bonding have a stronger affinity to each other. So they will have a higher boiling point than molecules that don't have hydrogen bonding. And likewise, in terms of application, in terms of your DNA, you see that the, um, the, um, the different um, bases, uh, they are connected uh, by hydrogen bonding right in terms of your alpha helix your beta sheets right and one fun thing to remember if we shift gears to london forces uh london forces are the weak uh intermolecular forces called dispersion forces and a good example of that is your gecko so if you notice you see like gecko running up and down the walls and that has to do with the fact that they have these a lot of tiny ears on their feet that can can um can help them to kind of connect with the wall through weak dispersion forces. And that's the reason why they can run all over your house and scare you. Next up on dispersion forces is as you increase the carbon chain length, you increase the surface area. And if you increase the surface area, it just means that you increase the, um, the connectivity of the dispersion forces. So that increases the boiling point. However, if you start to branch, as shown to the right, and that decreases the surface area and that decreases your boiling point. So that is um, your summary crash course of chapter one. 